Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session on how Hulu reinvented the TV using AWS Cloud. Wow, this room is totally full. I see, still see people waiting outside. A lot of glare in the eyes, so sorry if I look down. Um, yeah, TV, live TV on the internet is an intricate problem, challenge, uh, especially when you're doing at the scale Hulu did it. They started with uh, 300 channels uh, in their preview, and they've gone well over 1,000 channels um, distributing uh, across the country. So we at AWS take pride that uh, we, were, it, we were taken as a partner by Hulu, and we were part of Hulu's journey in reinventing the experience and the offering to customers. And this got launched back in May, so the customers have been delightfully using the service since then. This session, you will learn about you know, the challenges, uh, the intricacies around setting and, and scaling the infrastructure, as well as how to kind of get the service with high availability, with the, with the failover, um, and the right quality to the, to the customers. So with the, without further ado, I want to invite uh, Bert, who is senior manager technology engineering at Hulu to kind of open the kimono for us and uh, show us how they did the, the whole engineering part of it. But over to you. Thank you very much, Niraj. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Bert. I am the engineer manager for the video team at Hulu. I've been working there for about um, three years. Uh, today, as Niraj mentioned, we're going to talk about our um, implementation of live TV using the uh, AWS cloud. Um, session will run about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll take uh, questions offline on the side of, of the stage after here for anyone interested. The AWS team will also be there. Um, so the presentation is going to be in different uh, sections. First one, I'm going to talk about a little bit about Hulu, uh, our service. Then I'm going to go into what makes our live TV experience uh, unique. The way we built that product in terms of experience was very specific. Um, which also resulted in, in very specific um, technical challenges. Then we'll dive deep into architecture and uh, the, the live video pipeline as well as the AWS infrastructure that supports it. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about the, um, some of the value-added services that we got from working uh, with AWS as a, as a partner. So first of all, uh, just a little survey to get an idea. How many of you in the audience uh, know about Hulu? OK, pretty good. How many of you are subscribers? OK, we can work on that a little bit. Uh, but, um, so uh, Hulu is, a, is a, at its core, a subscription, subscription video on demand service. Um, so basically, the idea from the get-go, our DNA has always been about uh, live TV. So next day after, uh, you know, next day TV that you can watch your favorite series, anything uh, on television. Um, we have two, uh, two different tiers. One is an ad supported um, service, which has been what we've done for, for a long time. Ad is a key part of Hulu and our monetization strategy. Um, so that's been since the beginning. Um, but we also have an ad free for, for, for folks who, who don't want ads. And we also have a premium add-on. So in addition to uh, all the you know, TV shows that you can, can watch, we also have HBO, Showtime, and Cinemax uh, available as uh, add-ons. Uh, one thing to mention, we're a US-only service. Um, so you know, this is a um, service limited to the US, at least for the time being. Um, and then in May of this year, we launched our Hulu with Live TV service, which basically is um, it is a natural, was a natural progression for us in terms of our service and bridged the gaps uh, in terms of content availability. So while through the SVOD service, you could see content uh, the next day, this gives you everything from the get-go live as well as on demand. So we're kind of bridging the gap there of content availability anytime, um, anywhere. One other thing I'd like to mention, we've, been, um, we've also been investing heavily in original content and have recently gotten an uh, Emmy nomination for um, Hands Made Still. I highly recommend you, you watch it. It's a, it's a great series. So 
So a little bit of uh, history just uh, uh, about Hulu. So we actually started in 2007, little known fact, as an ad-supported uh, video-on-demand service, so free service, sort of like YouTube. Uh, it was web only at the time. It was a very innovative product because there was no other way to get um, TV over the top. <clears throat> In 2010, we then um, brought in to more devices, so not just web, but also living room devices, mobile devices, um, as well as a broader uh, content uh, availability. In 2015, we listened to customer demand. Um, again, ads always been a key part of Hulu, but we also added a, a, an ad-free option, and at that point also added uh, some of the premium uh, channel content. Then finally, in um, May of this year, we launched our uh, Hulu with Live TV product, um, which also includes the uh, ASVOD catalog. So the nice thing about our offering uh, compared to other uh, uh, competitors is that we also, we don't just have the live TV channels and content, but you also get all of our original content and what you would get through our ASVOD service as part of it. So about Hulu as a company, so we're a very tech-driven culture at Hulu. We've been uh, from the get-go, um, that was the case. Uh, we always joke about having you know, our own uh, dial-in uh, phone number system, about having our own pager duty. It's not the case today. We use more off-the-shelf product, but that's very ingrained in the culture. Um, that's true across kind of verticals, which you can see here, different teams. Um, in, the, in the video world, it's also true. To give you a little uh, glimpse of it, we, um, our video on demand uh, platform was built uh, in-house and is uh, uh, in our data centers. Um, out of, everything was built out of our data centers up until this product. And so we've got 600 machines that are doing both distributed uh, storage, distributed file system, as well as compute. Um, we also built our own origin to the CDNs. Um, we don't do our own content delivery. We work with multiple CDN partners, but we do have um, a lot of logic around quality of service and doing CDN switching uh, based on how um, CDNs are performing in different um, regions. So again, very, you know, very tech-driven, very build-your-own, very also in our data center. This live product was actually our first step into the cloud. We were, we were completely new to this <clears throat> in terms of building a whole end-to-end -end stack in the cloud. All right, let's uh, move on to the, um, let's now talk a little bit about the experience. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit more about what made um, our experience unique. So this first slide is, uh, kind of illustrates in a, you know, in a visual way what traditional TV broadcast is, right? This is a uh, broadcast operations center uh, on the left with a lot of screens. And then on the right is Hulu uh, launching our live TV uh, services. This was actually the day that we launched um, and some of the AWS folks were, were on site with us. Uh, and you can see there's names of different teams here. So the point, the point I'm trying to make here is we're lean and mean, right? We're a tech company and it's a different, um, it's a completely different um, domain than, than live broadcast is. However, uh, I'll say that since then, we've also built our own network operation center because uh, we do need some form of live on, uh, eyes on glass while we try to automate and monitor things automatically as much as possible. Uh, we've also had to build it, so keep that in mind. Okay, so the core of our product, our live TV product, is basically um, every channel that you can get. So imagine your cable TV um, at home, your traditional cable TV, you can get thousands of channels on it. Well, what we did with this product is basically give you the same, um, you know, same set of channels available uh, on any device. Um, so we have over a thousand channels today uh, that we aggregate from uh, multiple vendors. Uh, we then store those uh, in Jest and, and store those in the cloud and uh, repackage them, repackage the content to serve various um, devices. So you can see today we're on Fire TV, 
Apple TV, iOS, Android, Chromecast, all the major devices. To give you an example of what that means for you, let's take Fox as an example as a content uh, partner. So assuming you're in Los Angeles, uh, you've got your uh, Fox channels. Well, you can watch um, network channels. So that's um, you know, series on FX, movies on FXM. You can also watch the national uh, sports channel, FS1, FS2. Uh, you can also get your regional sports uh, channels from Fox. So Sp Fox Sports West in Los Angeles is, is one you'd get. Um, and if you want your local affiliate, local news, KTTV, Fox 11, Los Angeles, also available through that. So when we talk about 1,000 channels, this is the, 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 you know, the total number of channels. But again, depending on where you are, you will get uh, your local affiliates for both sports and, and so forth. And we'll talk a little bit later about uh, the challenges around aggregating these many channels. Okay, so one of the things that we set to do with this product when we built it and that our, our product team was very bullish about was completely changing the experience of consuming uh, live TV. So traditional experience with a cable TV is one to many, so everyone gets the same content. You get thousands of channels that you have to browse through. Uh, as our head of product calls it, it's a giant Excel sheet of, of channels that you have to go through to try and find something that's relevant to you. Well, Hulu being an SVOD service at its core, we, um, you know, we had a lot of personalization that was part of already our experience in the, in the SVOD world. So it was a natural progression and logic to bring that to life. And so the idea behind the product is to abstract the notion of channels and linear channels um, into programs. Because at the end of the day, a channel is a list of programs uh, sequential programs that for some may be relevant to you, for some may, may not. And so one of the key part of our experience was, again, bringing um, everything as a program, whether live or post-live or, or on-demand. We'll see that there were some, a lot of challenges around that because that means having rich metadata around programs, boundaries, uh, to make sure that we can splice programs to be able to, to show them um, accurately. A little bit more about the experience. So a few things. So again, everything's a program. So content discovery is key. Personalization is key. Um, so we've got a kind of a first screen where you can see all your programs. There's a, a, a curated personal list of assets that we think are relevant to you. That might be a, a game. If you're a football fan, that's going on right now. Or we might actually send you a push notification because you need to watch it right away. Or it can be your favorite series, whether it's one that we have, whether it's Hands Made Still that we have in our VOD catalog, or whether it's one that's aired on FX a few hours ago. We also noticed that um, while this experience is nice, we do still have a number of users that for which the transition of going from cable to, um, to our experience is difficult. So we've also added ways to browse content through sports networks and even channels. It just isn't the main part of the experience. Another key thing about Hulu, which again has to do with our, um, you know, our identity, we're managed by all the uh, major um, studios. So um, as I mentioned earlier, ad monetization is key, uh, and also um, ad avoidance is key, uh, preventing ad avoidance is key. So one of the things we built with the uh, experience is when you're watching, whether you're watching a live or VOD content, we freeze uh, transport controls on the player when you're uh, going through an ad so that ads can't be uh, skipped through. So that, that's part of the experience. It's also very critical for something that we're working on for the future, which is dynamic ad insertion. So the idea is also for live content, you can overlay an ad with a, a personalized one to improve the experience. Uh, and again, what that means is really good boundaries between ads and programs are necessary. We need really good metadata to be able to do that. <laughs> so some of the challenges we, we faced with this kind of high level, and we'll, we'll go through the technical ones, but 
The one I just mentioned was the uh, linear ad markers, right? So if we want to block transport controls or do dynamic ad insertion, we need very reliable metadata. Uh, you can see in the, in the screenshot here, you've got a program that's composed of different uh, sort of chapters or section. You've got a first uh, content section followed by a national and local ad. So for example, we might want to, we want to block transport controls during any ad break. But the local ad would be the one where we're, we're able to dynamically insert ads. So if we need really good, um, really good markers between those to know exactly uh, what to do when. Another one was we were one of the first large-scale um, Dash rollouts. So we're basically serving Dash to all non-Apple devices and HLS to Apple devices. Uh, and that came with a number of challenges. Um, for example, um, to, to give you an example of uh, uh, integration challenges, we had uh, Roku. Uh, it was their first Dash Live uh, implementation. So we had to work closely with them to, to stabilize that, um, that stack. Multiple ingest formats. You saw the, the picture with all the different channels. We, we basically had, um, you know, we, we had uh, different partners with different uh, needs. It was very hard to standardize on, on one single format. Uh, some of the national channels, for example, are available as a MPEG-2 transport stream over IP, kind of the traditional contribution model. But some of the some other channels, um, and especially when you start looking at event-based channels or, or live events, are only available in um, HLS. So we'll, we'll dive a little deeper there, but that was, that was one of the big challenges. Uh, we had 500, 500 days to build the service, so um, you know, that was kind of our, our timeline. Um, part of the decision we made was to use AWS was also to be able to be very flexible uh, in the resources that we could spin up. Again, we went from 300 to 1,000 channels very quickly. Uh, being able to do that in AWS was, was key. And then finally, content security. Again, we're, we're owned by all the, uh, all the major studios, so content security is paramount. Um, being owned by them means we're also the poster child for, for the industry, so we were, we're held against a uh, tight standard. So for Dash, um, we, we implemented common encryption and fair play uh, for HLS. Um, which is also not that common in the, in the live space. <clears throat> All right, now that we uh, went through the experience, let's, let's dive uh, right into the, uh, the technical aspects. So this is a um, functional diagram of our end-to-end uh, -end pipeline or, or workflow for live. Um, the center piece circled in, in red is what we'll talk about in terms of AWS infrastructure, but I wanted to give you a full, um, a full view of it. So on the left, we've got uh, various um, encoding sources. Um, those can be pre-encoded HLS streams, as I mentioned, or MPEG-2 TS transport streams that are routed or sent to some of our encoding vendors. Um, so we've got, we, again, we tried to standardize the, um, the, the video um, profiles on a, a profile layer uh, with uh, four second segments, but that wasn't always the case. Certain vendors had their encoding specs, couldn't match, so we, we had to work with that. Another key part of what we got from the vendors in addition to the uh, video segments, the HLS video segments, was the manifest. Uh, we didn't use the manifest just simply to refer to the segments, but we also used it to carry uh, some of the necessary metadata for um, ad breaks. So SCUDI 35 is a, basically a standard for carrying uh, in-band um, uh, program and ad marker metadata that we use, and we have our vendors uh, include those in the manifest. We then publish uh, those streams either from the vendors or when we have direct HLS through HTTPS to our backend um, in, um, in EC2, in AWS. At that point, we repackage, we take that content. So think of HLS for us as a contribution format. We're not serving that directly to the end user. We're taking it and repackaging to both Dash uh, with common encryption, um, HLS with fair play to serve the, the end user. So we, we repackage the content. We then push the segments to uh, S3, which acts as the CDN origin. 
And then we have a manifest generation service which creates manifests on the fly to serve uh, end users. And finally, uh, we've got a Dash client here, but we also have HLS clients on the other side. Um, those uh, manifests and that repackaged content gets consumed by our, um, our clients. So in the case of Dash, for example, we take the ad metadata and splice content and ads using uh, periods. In HLS, we use tags to, to do the same thing. Um, our encoding vendors take embedded captions from the source streams in CA608, pass them through uh, to the client, so we don't touch that, but the, but the client device does decode uh, captions. And then a uh, uh, last component of what we do is the um, Nielsen ID3 tags. Again, uh, measurement, audience measurement is key um, for Hulu and for our, our, um, our owners. So we need to make sure that everything is, is measured uh, to Nielsen standards on the other end. So that gets packaged in MP4 um, uh, e-message e box. All right, so now here's the um, overview of the AWS infrastructure supporting that, that workflow. So I won't go too much into detail here because we're gonna actually uh, zoom in and dive deeper on each different area. Uh, but, but the flow is basically from the left, we have our uh, encoding vendors that encode content and publish it uh, to our packaging service, which is a number of EC2 backends. We actually run um, those, that packaging service as well as the manifest on the right using uh, our in-house uh, platform as a service uh, called Donkey, which our, our DevOps team here supports. Um, from, from the content here that we package, two things happen. For, for, on the one side, we take the, um, we take the segments, repackage them to Dash and HLS, store them in S3 at the origin. We also take all the video metadata that we get, whether it's um, actually you know, bit rate, things like that about each uh, rendition, but also the SCSI 35 markers that we later use for, for ad logic, and store them in RDS Aurora. And then finally, um, so RDS Aurora basically is the, um, get, you know, data gets written from our packaging service there and then gets read from our manifest service to form the, the manifest for the, the end user. And then finally, S3 gets used as an origin to deliver uh, video segments uh, to multiple CDNs, to CloudFront and other CDNs. So let's first um, zoom into the ingest packaging, so the, the left part of what we saw um, earlier. So again, the workflow there is we get the M3U8, uh, which is the HLS manifest from the vendors that uh, includes the segment um, that, that have been posted to us, uh, as well as SCSI 35 markers. Um, we then take the video segments as well and repackage them on the fly to um, to uh, then store them in S3. One of the key things here, and we'll, we'll go a little bit more in, in detail, but we found that this, um, this model requires uh, very reliable connectivity because uh, all of that is posted in HTTPS. Um, so as you saw in the previous slide, we use Direct Connect whenever possible uh, for reliable connectivity with our vendors. Uh, we've also had to do a lot of tweaking from the encoders. Um, what we found is a lot of encoders are typically designed to uh, basically create content that is going to be consumed by the, by the end device. In our case, we're repackaging it, so we add this latency in the middle because we're, we're, we're doing all this processing. So what that meant is we, we had to do a lot of work with our vendors to um, tweak the, the retry and the timeout logics for segments because they basically have to expect us to take longer than a dumb storage that, who's just storing the, the assets that are encoded. So again, um, infrastructure supporting this is either direct connect whenever possible or internet, if that's our only option, uh, from, from the encoding servers or encoding vendors. 
The, we've got a number of EC2 backends. Again, that's managed through our, our internal path. So we create, um, you know, we create an application uh, for our packaging service that's backed by a number of um, EC2 instances. And um, in multiple availability zones for, for redundancy. So um, the, the way the, those backends are, are separated is evenly amongst three different availability zones. The next step after we've uh, repackaged content is, to, is a storage piece. So on two fronts, the, the first one is the, the video. The, the segments we've repackaged, so MP4 for, for Dash and TS for, for HLS, get published to Amazon S3. Then on the other side, the video metadata that we extract, um, the metadata we extract both from the video segments and the manifest, get uh, stored in uh, Aurora RDS. Uh, because, those, um, because the backends are independent um, in, in terms of our repackaging service, we do have, a, we use um, Elastic Cache as a shared memory between them until we persist the data. And the logic there is basically um, playlist and segments are, um, are separate. So we can start processing any video segment as soon as we get them. We return 200, HTTP 200 for the ones that we've successfully um, processed. And then our encoding vendors include those that were successfully processed in the playlist. At that point, when we get the playlist, that becomes the source from the vendor, that becomes the source of truth for these are all the, the segments that were successfully published and repackaged. And then we can consider, we can lock those in um, for, for delivery. Um, one of the things we learned there, and that was very, um, very helpful um, from, from the AWS uh, team, is um, you, need to, you need to deal with uh, S3 latency jitter. So if you look at, um, if you look at um, latency on S3, which we measure pretty closely, um, you'll notice some obvious things like top of the hour uh, spikes in latency due to you know, a lot of people working. Uh, doing um, batch uh, workloads, uh, but also uh, changes in latency uh, during uh, normal operations. So we've had to, to, to tweak a, a lot of retry logic around that. And uh, again, Amazon was really helpful in, in learning and telling us about this and helping and guiding us to a, a solution around that. So this is uh, the, the uh, infrastructure, AWS infrastructure supporting this, this piece of the workflow. So again, the EC2 instances running on our pass uh, use a shared uh, Redis cache on Elastic Cache. Then once data is ready to be persisted, we get the manifest that gets stored in uh, RDS um, Aurora. A typical Aurora setup where um, one inst you know, we've got a master um, in one of the availability zones if it fails, then uh, one of the slaves in another availability zone uh, would get promoted to master at that point. And finally, uh, manifest and delivery uh, piece. So again, we store all the metadata in Aurora. We have a manifest service that um, generates uh, manifests on the fly. Um, the reason for that is um, we need to, we have a lot of custom logic between the uh, player and the back end um, through the players that we've built. Um, we're also kind of setting the stage for dynamic ad insertion where um, if we're gonna serve personalized ads that are specific to a given user, we, they need to be generated on the fly. There, there's no way around it. So that's kind of the, the background for, for our architecture there. Um, we, obviously, the, the manifest service has a, 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 a quite important load, especially compared to our video on demand um, experience where you get a manifest at the beginning of a playback session. It doesn't get refreshed after that. In live, every three seconds or so, um, the client is refreshing the manifest. So the load on the back end is, is, is substantial. And um, one of the things we've had to do as part of that is, um, is a cache uh, wherever possible and at different levels. 
So on the next slide, you can see here, on the right, our manifest service is a um, number of EC2 instances, right? An app running on, over EC2. And on top of that, we've had to uh, use local memory cache on those instances uh, as kind of a first tier. Second tier cache using uh, Redis. So over the network, you take a little bit of a performance hit. Uh, but again, it's a second tier cache. Then the other uh, tier of cache is uh, we have a three-second TTL on the manifest, and the CDNs are supposed to cache that pretty well. Typically, um, we've seen a lot of variation uh, with CDN partners, some of them basically pulling uh, harder than others. And so we've had to uh, also build a lot of, um, in addition to this uh, recently, an HTTP cache that acts as a shield um, um, from the CDNs to kind of uh, shield, sh shield that and reduce the load to our, to our service. Um, similarly, for segments, video segments, our DevOps team uh, built a, uh, also an HTTP caching layer. We, we modeled the, the write and read um, throughput uh, with the AWS team, uh, which was very helpful and realized we were with limits, but we wanted to have a mitigation in case uh, we had a bad actor uh, in terms of a CDN, or we added more CDNs and the load increased to a point where um, S3 was reaching its limits. All right, so I'm, now I want to talk about some of the lessons we learned uh, while building this service, which is kind of the most important piece. Hopefully, uh, if anyone um, in this audience is looking to build uh, something, you can, you can learn from, from our mistakes and our learnings. Um, so the first one was uh, encoding uh, an ingest. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, but there was a lot of, um, a lot of logic we had to, to, to do to, to make that reliable. Um, so the first piece is, um, as I mentioned, make sure you have good connectivity, right? Especially if you're going over HTTP, you're not using any uh, additional transport protocols, um, you know, for, for um, things like forward error correction or things like that. It's very important to have good connectivity. Um, so, you know, direct connect wherever possible, um, it, very important. Uh, another one was the um, um, alignment across segments. So, what we realized with our encoding vendors uh, pretty quickly is that um, this also has to do with the fact that a lot of encoders are, are, are designed to publish content for um, consumption, direct consumption to clients. Because we have a model where uh, we're using as a contribution stream that we're repackaging, uh, we realized that there were a lot of things with the content that were, weren't what we expected. So for example, if you look at segments across renditions, a lot of times uh, PTS timestamps are not aligned. Uh, that's something that an HLS player will very uh, gracefully deal with. Uh, that's not something that we can afford if we're repackaging to Dash. So we had to work closely with our vendors to, um, to improve that. Some of the other examples were SCUDI 35 markers in the manifests. Uh, those are pretty tricky. Uh, you can have multiple versions of the same marker um, that uh, you, know, you need to figure out which one's the source of truth. So doing a lot of uh, working with our vendors uh, to, to sort of clean that up and get the, the, the version of truth for, for markers was uh, very, uh, very important, and it's still a work in progress. On the storage side, as I mentioned, um, you know, S3 um, learning to deal with, uh, with, uh, with S3 latency is, is very important. So we actually, um, that, that was one of the things where, where AWS really helped us, uh, you know, just put the finger on this, say, guys, just be aware of this. You need to, to, to deal with it, and here's how you might want to approach it. Uh, another one is, uh, in the video world, typically if you're generated segments that are uh, sequential, with sequential names, uh, you can hit hotspots in S3 because the way that um, the, the way that S3 is designed is that they end up hitting the same um, shards. Uh, that was another thing that AWS mentioned um, mentioned to us early on, uh, and that we worked uh, around. So, for example, we um, you know we we have a, a map of channels that are, are sharded, and um, and and the AWS team basically updates that uh, to make to add some entropy to it to make sure that they all land on different, um, on different shards. 
Um, also mentioned that there was something we, had, we looked into, didn't end up implementing, but that AWS, um, I think recently offered, uh, is a service by the name of Jellyfish, uh, which basically takes care of some of that logic for you, especially when, with regards to file naming. So it's, uh, they can speak to it better than I can, but it's a layer on top of um, S3 that basically does the renaming for you, so don't, you don't have to, to do that yourself. Um, so something to, to look into. Uh, on the manifest and delivery side, as I mentioned, um, because of the load on the service, uh, caching wherever possible at different levels uh, very, is very important. Uh, understanding the workflows of, um, and the workload, sorry, from the CDNs is very important as well. So measure, look at your different CDN partners, uh, understand how much load they're bringing back to the origin. In certain cases, we've had to talk to the, them about adding shielding on their end, changing the mapping because they were pulling very hard, and you know, just plan accordingly. So uh, like our DevOps team did, um, if you can spin up a, a pretty um, straightforward HTTP caching layer uh, in front of S3, that's a good mitigation in case things go wrong. On the um, monitoring side, so monitoring, a key part of live for us, that's been a, a, a big learning experience. Um, the one thing in live is you can't fall behind live, right? So you have a hard, um, hard performance against, uh, against this. You, you just can't fall behind. So you have to measure things for one end to end, but at every step. So one of the things we did, for example, is for each segment that we receive, we actually have a timeline of the entire workflow that, that you saw here. So we measure throughput from the, um, from the encoding vendors. We measure processing time for us to repackage it. We measure um, how long it takes to push to S3. And, um, and then we also have the, the client side, which is, well, how quickly does that get to the end client in a, in a manifest? So measuring, monitoring, and measuring everything is, uh, is very critical. It's also critical because when you're doing that at scale over 1,000 channels, um, it, 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 you just need automated tools to do that, right? So you might look at things like, for, for example, we look at missing segments across channels. So maybe if you have a missing segment on one rendition, that's pretty recoverable from a client. But if you have missing segments across all video renditions and for a, a, a given amount of time, that becomes a big problem. So doing that and, and fine tuning that signal to noise ratio is, uh, is very tricky. Um, in addition, I mentioned that earlier, eyes on glass, again, not scalable, but very important because on the top channels that we have, top viewership, when we get you know, um, big uh, football games, for example, uh, we need our knock and we need people to actually look at the quality of the video. Uh, our vendors don't always catch issues, and so if there's a visual glitch or something you know, that, that is not detected by our tools, um, we, we need actual people to look at them. Then on the infrastructure piece, um, I'd say a very, very important thing is uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the great things about AWS is you get services out of the box. You can sign up with a credit card, you can you know, add a service and you can start using it. It's tempting not to really understand how each service uh, works and its capabilities and its limits. Um, for us, it was really important because we were new to the game and we didn't really know that. Uh, some of it we learned the hard way, but a lot of it, luckily, we learned through our relationship with um, AWS. They were very transparent. Uh, you know, they kind of opened up, um, opened the kimono and told us, okay, this is the limits of the service. There were cases where they even brought uh, subject matter experts to talk about it. Um, but, but a key part of AWS, just like if you're doing your infrastructure, you want to know these limits, that the same goes for, for AWS. Another recommendation that, um, that AWS made, um, which um, for, for um, reliability purposes, is uh, using a cell-based uh, architecture to reduce blast radius. So what I mean by that is uh, basically, um, finding a way to shard or separate um, your workflow. So for example, for us, it's a thousand channels. So um, you know, a, a basic approach might be, well, let's separate partners, uh, encoding vendors or sources, so that if one has a problem, it doesn't affect the rest of the channels. 
Uh, obviously, you probably want to get a little bit more fine-tuned than this, right? You might want to uh, create a more granularity around this. It comes with management overhead, but it does limit uh, um, the, the potential um, um, blast radius of, a, of an issue. Um, also, multi-AZ, which is you know, kind of common, um, common things that AWS will, uh, will tell you about. Do you want to be in multi, multiple regions, multiple availability zones? What's your risk profile? So just kind of think about that. Um, another thing related to infrastructure that we found um, uh, with our DevOps team is, um, or that we're looking into is uh, leveraging um, ECS, uh, Elastic Container Service. Um, so while running our pass over AWS, we found that um, sometimes the integration with LBs can be a little slow. So that can lead into um, slow deployments. Obviously in live, being able to deploy or roll back changes immediately is, is, is paramount. So that's one of the things we're, we're, we're looking at. Another advantage of ECS um, that, we can, that we can get from integrating with it is uh, things like auto scaling. So being able to scale very dynamically resources up and down uh, we look at our traffic patterns, for example, on our uh, manifest service from clients, they're very seasonal, right? They're, there's very clear peaks during the day when people are viewing content, very clear troughs. Um, so we can, we can leverage that in the cloud. It's, a new it's kind of a new thing for us because we haven't used the cloud, but that's one of the advantages also to keep uh, costs low is to, is to auto scale. And finally, uh, sort of general lessons that we've learned. Uh, might seem obvious, but you can't fix things after the fact in live. So you just can't mess up. You, you, you either need, you, you need redundancy, you need multiple sources if your sources aren't reliable, but that's kind of a key thing that we learn. Uh, in the VOD world, we could come back, we had the source of truth, a mezzanine asset. If our encode fails, we can come back to it and fix it. And we usually have time to do that. In live, there's uh, no way around it. So it's really forced us to think about reliability. Um, and then another one that we um, also learned is um, just stress test everything. So understand the limits of each individual system. When we set up Aurora, for example, uh, we, we tested the limits of Aurora uh, with the uh, AWS team. They helped us do that. Um, so you want to test each individual component, but you also want to test end to end. Uh, and the challenge there is doing a test in a way that is representative of production. So for example, for, for, for our case, in, in streaming, we've created um, a, um, our DevOps team helped us create a, um, a mocked player. It's basically a, a script that runs on multiple backends, actually using AWS, uh, in different regions, and calls our manifest service acting like a player. Um, so that's pretty good, uh, but there's also cases that we see uh, when we look at logs and our production traffic, it looks a little bit different than what that script might do. So one of the things we're looking at is uh, replaying logs uh, with some sort of multiplication factor with scale to be able to have something more representative of, uh, of actual production. All right, so to, to finish, I wanted to talk a little bit about our uh, partnership with, um, with AWS. Uh, I mentioned this throughout the, uh, the presentation, but um, we really, really had great support from, from the AWS folks to, to build this, um, to build our life product. Uh, again, we were completely new to the cloud, um, and they really helped us uh, get there uh, really fast and, and learn really fast. So, you know, you, again, you can go and sign up for an AWS account and start using services. We got a lot more than that through our relationship, and I just want to mention that for folks who, um, you know, who, who are going through the same thing, because that's not always obvious. So uh, there were different levels of the partnership that really helped us. The first one was just technical, general technical advisorship. Um, from, the, from the beginning, the, the team you know, was, uh, was very available to tell us about each component that we used, even give us recommendation on what tools to use for what use case. Um, things like S3 limits that I talked about earlier were things that they mentioned really early on. They brought in uh, experts a few times to talk to us um, and didn't hesitate to kind of put the resources to, to help us. Um, 
Other levels that are more kind of formal uh, relationships uh, and commercial uh, are uh, professional services. So in addition to this sort of general guidance and advisorship, we were able to leverage a few times um, the professional services team. One example is uh, the uh, Aurora RDS uh, piece that we built. Um, so we designed the data model. Um, my team did this with AWS, but when it came down to implementing it, uh, meaning deploying this across AZs, doing the monitoring, making sure everything runs fine, running stress tests around, uh, against it, uh, we actually had a, um, a, a person from AWS uh, come on site to, to help us with that. And that did two things. One, it, a it accelerated the, uh, the delivery of it, so it kind of enhanced the team in a way. But the other really uh, great thing about it is it, it accelerated the learning uh, of my team um, around this, meaning that the developers working on this had not worked on this before, and having someone who had the experience meant they knew the system very well and very fast. And the last piece of the, um, of the relationship with AWS that was uh, very helpful was um, kind of two, uh, two different processes. The first one was uh, operational readiness review, um, which was an ongoing process uh, about basically having a transparent conversation with AWS about here's your infrastructure, here are the risks. You know, do you want to go multi-AZ? Do you want to go multi-region? Um, so forth, and basically just listing those and going through them regularly to agree on the level of risk that we were comfortable with. And so we were able to make well-informed decisions on, okay, well, this is something that we might want to do for launch. We're launching in, we launched in beta, so we said, okay, that might be acceptable for beta, might not be acceptable for, for production. Um, the good thing is we're hands down kind of building the product, and so having AWS help us step back to think about this was, was really helpful. Um, and the last piece of that, uh, so operational readiness review was an on, ongoing thing. The last piece of it is um, IEM, which is uh, infrastructure event management. And that's basically the day of launch. Uh, so you go through a process with AWS, making sure that, okay, here are the um, uh, estimates for traffic at launch, um, going through everything, and actually AWS uh, is there monitoring during launch in case anything happens? So in the war room picture that you saw earlier, we actually had an AWS team that was there monitoring everything uh, and kind of celebrating uh, with us as we launched. All right, so I want to... Um, I want to thank AWS uh, for, um, for, for being an, a really good partner throughout, um, throughout this launch, uh, and we really look forward to, to working with them more. Uh, like I said, we'll take um, questions offline on the side of the stage um, if you have any, any questions following the, the presentation. Thank you.